Chapter 55 I have prayed at the spring of courage, and at the spring of power, yet neither awoke anything inside of me. The day had been perfect, a truly perfect day. Their travel preparations were complete. The other champions, those that had shown up at least, damn that Rito, had arrived, and Link managed to convince Zelda to go riding with him. It was only supposed to be an early morning ride. Link knew that Zelda was excited to spend time with her Bosa, and hadn't intended on taking her away for the whole day. But as they'd ridden out, he let Zelda choose their direction and pace, and she just kept going. She'd left, looking freer than she had for days, her hair streaming out behind her as she galloped storm over fields and through streams of water. But maybe up there, Perhaps the Spring of Wisdom, the final of the three, will be the one. He'd meant it as an early birthday present, since her actual birthday would be spent traveling in the direction of Mount Laneru. Tensions were high at the castle. He still didn't think she'd spoken to her father since he berated her outside of her tower. And the priests were... well, the less he thought about it, the better. Link figured that she would enjoy some time away. In the castle, Zelda seemed to suffocate, especially now that she had been forbidden from her studies. She spent days locked away in her room, only coming out to pray. She didn't even visit the library anymore. He and the priests were often the only people that she saw during the day. But out in the wild, she came alive. She was like a different person, vibrant, happy. She was always beautiful, but the grass, the trees, and the flowers accentuated that beauty to an otherworldly degree. Her eyes, her smile, her skin, her hair. To be honest, I have no real reason to think that will be the case, but there's always a chance that the next moment will change everything. He loved her. It was painful for him to admit but he'd given up trying to pretend otherwise. He knew that there wasn't the likelihood of a future for them. He was a knight, and not a highly placed one at that. She a princess. Perhaps if the calamity arrived and he defeated it, then his status would be elevated enough. But no. That was like wishing to break one's arm to get out of sword practice. Foolish. But he allowed himself to dream on days such as this, when they laughed together, when they confided secrets to each other, when they walked together, when they laid together in the grass looking up at the clouds and spoke of a future without this burden hanging over them. On days such as this, he allowed himself to dream that she loved him back, that when she saw him, she saw not a close friend, not a hero, not the champion. He dreamed that she saw a man, a lover, Maybe even a husband. A companion for the rest of time. But all the good days must eventually come to an end. Tomorrow is my 17th birthday. Tomorrow, they would begin their journey to Mount Laneru. It would take several days to arrive, but Zelda insisted that they not leave until she turned 17. That was important to her. She would not risk even that. And so, with a heavy heart, Link finally insisted that they needed to go back to the castle. He'd promised Arl that he would cook dinner for them tonight. He would spend just a little more time with her before they left on this next journey. Maybe he would pick up a trinket from Kokoriko Village for her on the way back. She always loved their carvings. But there was one last thing that he needed to do first. Princess, are you... going to retire to your quarters... He asked, carefully to show proper deference now that they were near the stables, 
where any number of servants could overhear him. The rumors lately were getting even more salacious. Not that this would honestly help prevent them. Zelda turned and looked to him curiously. I was going to... She hesitated, seeing his insistent expression. Oh, um, yes. That is where I'm going right now. Link nodded. Very well. There is something that I need to retrieve, and then I will meet you there. She frowned in confusion, but Link said nothing more, bowing and then hurrying off into the castle. He made his way through the castle at a controlled pace, not wanting to seem too rushed, too excited. But each moment apart from her felt like a lifetime. Goddess, I sound like Rao. I probably got that from one of his stupid songs. He tried not to think about the Sheikah poet, or the way that his songs and poetry seemed to capture what Link felt far more eloquently than he, himself, could ever hope to put into words. At the very least, he was fairly certain that Zelda wasn't interested in the Sheikah. He knew that Rao had done some research on some Sheikah shrines with her, but that had been before he and Zelda had been even traveling together. She rarely remarked upon the poet. Link finally made it to the place where he'd hidden the object. It wouldn't have done to keep it in his room. He'd chosen an interior room close to Zelda's, and it had no windows. So he kept it in a secluded place in one of the other towers. The room was used for storage, and people rarely frequented it. The dust on the floor had been disturbed by the many times he'd visited this room over the past weeks, but everything else was how it should have been. He retrieved the object he came for, carefully setting it inside of a simple sack that he'd found. This way, no one would comment on him walking through the castle with it in the direction of Zelda's room. Oh, the rumors that it would cause. Of course, what else is new? I can't even glance in her direction without the maids giggling and whispering to each other as of late. He'd even been questioned by some curious knights last week. Apparently the rumors were spreading. They would have to do something about it, but what? What exactly could they do to stop such things from being said? Finally, he set off for Zelda's bedroom. He stuck to the upper levels of the castle, making his way through its labyrinthine halls until finally arriving at her door. He carefully shifted his package behind his back in one hand, and with the other he lifted a hand to knock. The door opened before he could knock twice. Zelda stood there no longer in her riding attire, but in a simple dress. It wasn't her prayer dress, thankfully, but it was just as beautiful on her. She'd brushed her hair, too. Her cheeks were slightly flushed as she looked out at him. She'd gotten changed surprisingly quickly. Uh, yes. Sir Link, so you are here. Why did she sound so nervous? Yes, Princess. He glanced to the side. Some servants were further down the hall, but they weren't looking in their direction. I had something that I wished to discuss with you, if now is a good time. Her eyebrows quirked up. They'd spent the day discussing things, but she didn't voice that question, instead smiling graciously at him and stepping back from her door. Please. Maybe I should have done this somewhere else in the garden? No. Too public. I should have done it while we were out riding. But then it might have been damaged. It was too late to change course now. He nodded and stepped into her room, careful to keep her from seeing what he hid behind his back. Zelda gently shut the door behind her and then turned, looking at him with a frown. What are you doing? He chuckled. I am keeping up appearances. Yes, but what are you doing? What couldn't you discuss with me while we were out riding today? Link took a deep breath. A steadying breath. His heart raced traitorously in his chest. It's not... I have something that I would like to give you for your birthday. Her cheeks flushed deeper. Oh, that is... She cut off as he pulled the sack from behind his back and walked to her tea table, gently setting it down before stepping back and nodding to her. I figured we wouldn't have much time tomorrow. She eyed him curiously, seemingly unsure of what to make of this interaction with him. In truth, Link didn't know what to make of it either. He was acting brashly, 
far too familiarly. Even for them. He was too close to revealing the truth. But at that moment, he didn't care. Finally, Zelda stepped up to the table and pinched the top of the sack, lifting it off of the object underneath. And there, sitting on the table, in a simple flower pot, was a beautiful, silent princess flower, fully bloomed and healthy. Zelda's breath caught, and she lifted a hand to her breast, staring at the flower with wide eyes. Link! He slowly stepped up to the table, looking at her. She looked up at him, eyes wide. It is beautiful, but... She bit her lip, a small crease appearing between her brows. It is a wonderful gift. Thank you. His heart sank. Was it a poor gift? I... You seemed to like that one we found in the field so much, and I thought... He trailed off. Goddess, this was a bad idea. No, I do, Zelda said quickly. It's just, well... Now that it has been potted, the flower will die soon. No one has ever gotten them to survive more than a couple of days out of the wild. That one has survived for over a month. What? She looked back up at him, her frown deepening. What do you mean? Link shook his head. He hadn't known what to expect. After that day with her and Arl, he'd thought repeatedly about the simple flower, unable to flourish anywhere but the wild. The comparison to Zelda was unmistakable. And so, one morning after their trip to the Spring of Power, before the sun had even risen, Link rode back out and retrieved it. He expected it to die quickly, as Zelda indicated it would. But it hadn't. That flower has been alive in the Northeast Tower for over a month now. Zelda was silent for a long time. He could tell that she was turning over his words in her mind. That spot between her eyebrows crinkled in exactly the same way it did whenever she was working through a difficult puzzle. It wasn't a frown, but more of a look of concentration. He learned to pick out the difference. Finally, her curiosity got the better of her, and she quickly took out the Sheikah slate, snapping a photograph of the flower. Then she leaned in close, inspecting it. Where did you get it? The urge plane. She paused, looking back at him. The same one. He nodded. She frowned even deeper, looking back at the flower. She took one of its petals between her fingers, gently rubbing it. It is a silent princess. How did you care for it? Link rubbed the back of his neck. I... watered it. Gave it direct sunlight. That was about all he'd been able to get out of the royal gardener when he'd asked about caring for flowers. The man had acted threatened by Link's questions. Yes, but what else did you do? You must have done something special. I watered it every day? Did you feed it anything special? You can feed flowers? Link, be serious. I need to know everything that you did. I'm, I am being serious. She looked at him exasperated. These don't survive in these conditions, period. Countless attempts have been made to cultivate them. They won't even survive in a garden, much less in a pot. Zelda... I just did what I told you. I retrieved the flower, I put it in a pot, and I watered it every day. Her fingers twitched, as if she desperately needed to be writing something down. Did she even realize that she did that? Okay, then. What kind of soil did you use? Ling shrugged. Dirt? But where did you get the dirt from? Well, some of it is the dirt it was sitting in. And the rest I dug up from the gardens. Don't tell the gardener, though. He's been looking for the stray dogs for weeks. And you keep it in the tower? Mm-hmm. But they've tried that. They've tried different altitudes and dirt compositions. They've tried using the dirt from where the flowers grew in the wild. They've done experiments with different nutrients and levels of sunlight. Link smiled, amused. I didn't know that people did so many experiments on flowers. Well, of course they do. People do experiments on everything. She looked back down at the flower, growing quiet. She ran a gentle finger over its petal again. Link, I... I don't... 
I don't know what you did, but this shouldn't be possible. Yeah, well, there's a lot of things that shouldn't be, but are, regardless. Zelda's breath caught. Link felt a flush rising up his neck. That had been an incredibly forward and foolish thing for him to say. What do you mean? She didn't look at him, eyes still focused on the flower before her. Link swallowed. I don't... She rose, turning to look at him. Her eyes held a question. What else shouldn't be? Her voice was breathless. He saw the pink flush returning to her cheeks. His hands twitched. What else shouldn't be? Every thought I have of reaching out to you, holding you, kissing you, telling you how much I... No. It just sounded like the right thing to say. I, I don't know. She continued to meet his eyes for a time, and then finally, she exhaled slowly. Some of the tension left the room, but he couldn't help but to think that she looked disappointed. But that could have also been his own wishful thinking. Zelda turned back to look at the flower. How did you know it would survive? I really didn't. I actually expected it to die, though... I didn't know how long it would take, but... There's always the chance that the next moment will change everything, right? Her eyes widened briefly before closing. A warm smile appeared on her lips. Yes. Yes, you're right. They remained like that for a time. Finally, Link cleared his throat. I'd... <clears throat> I'd better get back to the town. Arl is going to scold me for getting home so late. Oh. Her eyes snapped open and she quickly nodded. Of course, we... We, we, wouldn't, want, we wouldn't want that now. Please, tell her that I said hello. I will. I am... Um... Happy birthday, Zelda. Thank you, Link. This has been a very special day. I'm very glad you convinced me to go with you. The room got much warmer as she said that, and he smiled, embarrassed. Well, what kind of night would I be if I didn't look out for your well-being? Of course. After saying a final goodbye, he stepped towards the door, opening it. Link. He paused, looking back at her. Her back was still turned toward him. She was gazing down at the silent princess. Despite the fact that some things shouldn't be, I'm happy they are. I'm... I'm very happy they are. He closed the door, mind spinning and heart racing. He awoke to the feeling of a cool, damp cloth upon his forehead. Link groaned softly his eyes fluttering open. Whoever was wiping his forehead gasped and pulled back. It took a moment for his vision to clear, but when it did, he found Paya standing over him, the wet cloth held tightly in her hand. Paya, what? He paused, taking in the rest of his surroundings. The bed, the beige walls, the rafters. My house? Oh, yes. We thought that you would be most comfortable here. We? Grandmother and I, and Aunt Para, she's the one who showed us where it was. As the memories of the distant past faded, they were replaced by much more recent events. He gasped and sat upright, though doing so immediately sent the world spinning around him. He groaned and reached up, pressing a hand to his head. Careful, Aya said, voice growing sharper. You might not be back to full strength yet. What happened? Link finally asked, when the room settled again. I remember the blood boon and fighting. The dead Lionel. The endless waves of monsters. The villagers to his back, helpless as he alone, stood between them and destruction. The way his strange power had peaked somehow. You protected us, she said breathlessly. I'd never... The way that you... He waited for her to continue, but she apparently didn't know what else to say. So finally, he asked, What about the others? Those at the gates, did they survive? So many monsters had rushed up the hill towards them. Aya nodded quickly. 
We suffered some losses, of course, but the monsters didn't seem very interested in fighting them. They just tried to get up the hill. To us. Link understood. They were being controlled by Ganon. Paya's eyes widened. I think that it must have known that it couldn't defeat us in time, but maybe. Maybe it thought by killing the helpless it could... break me again. Paya was silent for a time. It was... She released a shaky breath, eyes growing distant. Terrifying. But you... She stopped, face turning red. She quickly looked away from him, smiling sheepishly. When you arrived, I... I knew we would be safe. Link smiled fondly at her embarrassment. She could be incredibly endearing. How long was I out? All night and most of the day? I need to get moving then. He threw off the blankets and Paya yelped. L Link! He looked down at himself. He wasn't wearing a shirt or pants. He only had on his pair of undershorts. I didn't know, he protested, pulling the covers back over himself. Where are my clothes? She pointed to his small bedside table, where a fresh champion's tunic had been laid out for him, along with clean trousers. And then she quickly hurried downstairs, so he could get changed. He rose from the bed, still feeling weaker than normal, but strong enough to move around now. He quickly donned the clothing, and found his boots at the foot of his bed. They had been scrubbed of all the grime from the battle. The Master Sword hung from a hook on his wall, and his shield sat against the wall right below it. When he was dressed and wearing his gear, he made his way down the stairs, surprised to see that a table with chairs now sat in the middle of the room below. Impa, Pura, and Robbie all sat around the table. Paya wasn't in the room, and he supposed that she might have left to give them some privacy. Click snap! There he is, Pura said, grinning up at him when she saw him. Impa looked up at him from her seat and smiled warmly. Welcome back to the land of the living, Link. You had us worried. Nonsense! There wasn't a scratch on him after the battle! You weren't there, Pura said. I swear I watched him get run through by a spear. His tunic was even torn in the front and back. Link absently reached down, touching his belly where the spear had pierced him. He glanced back up to see Impa, eyeing him curiously. There are some things that you haven't told us. Link walked to the table and sat heavily in the last remaining chair, sighing. Yeah, like how you can survive being stabbed and move faster than the blink of an eye, Pura said. And how you can look so... She waved her hands at him. That, after what we all just went through. He raised an eyebrow towards Pura, but decided not to indulge her. Instead, he looked at Impa. Mifa. When I freed her, she somehow gave me her healing power. It doesn't usually work that effectively, but it interacts strangely with the Master Swords sometimes. Very useful, Impa said, nodding. And what of your speed? Para is not exaggerating, you moved faster than I've ever seen someone move before. When that Lionel showed up, you... Hell, I don't know what you did to it, Pura said, cutting Impa off. One second, it was charging at you, and the next its entire side was opened and spraying malice. Link shrugged. Not really sure what to say. It's just something I can do. I've been able to do it for a long time, though I didn't really know how to control it until recently. But when I concentrate during a battle, I can slow everything else around me. For a few seconds at least. Fascinating, Robbie said, leaning forward. I've heard of this before. Time dilation. That's what the Yiga Master called it. Yes, that doesn't surprise me. The question is, why do you know how to do it? From what I understand, it is an ancient Shika technique. One that I only know about from a mere scrap that mentions it. The only that I've ever found. It easily predates the previous iteration of Climate again. Link fell silent for a time. Finally, he shook his head. I don't know. But I think I've been using it all my life. It's 
stronger now than it used to be. Well, of course. It's probably like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger they will become. Robbie tapped his fingers on the table for a moment, and then hopped down from his chair. I need to write that down. I wonder if you have Sheikah blood in your ancestry. Incredible! Impa cleared her throat, looking at Link. What you did last night was incredible. You slew well over two hundred monsters on that hill. And that isn't counting those that you were responsible for at the gate and elsewhere. Two hundred? The Master Sword helped. It could kill them, even with the slightest nick. Pura snorted. Oh yes, you want to fight against hundreds of monsters single-handedly, come out without a scratch on you, and you give your sword the credit. I was stabbed. Repeatedly. Still, Pura is right, even after everything you've accomplished. The skill that you showed last night was unlike anything I have ever seen or heard of. I believe that you are ready to end this. Link hesitated. How long will it take to get things ready? To move the armies and prepare? Whatever it is that you are preparing. Two weeks, Impa pursed her lips. Many will arrive sooner, but the bulk of the Hylians and Sheikah will not have horses. Even without taking extensive supplies, it will take at least that. Link swore softly, and then looked at Pura. And what about you? Do you think you'll be able to retake control of the Guardians? Pura tapped a pencil on the table for a few moments. I think so. But this is complicated stuff. Snap. This isn't something that we can just solve overnight, even with those books. She glanced at Impa. Two weeks, though? Assuming that our theories are spot on, then yes, I think so. Link nodded slowly. Then we attack in two weeks. That'll be plenty of time for the Divine Beast to get into place, too. Maybe too much time. Robbie looked up from the bag that he was rustling through. He finally came up with a pad of paper. Do you think Ganon would break free before then? I don't know. Zelda says that it was preparing for my arrival. But it's not fighting to escape now like before. At least it wasn't. Pura's eyes narrowed. Okay. I need you to explain. What do you mean that she is telling you all of this? Impa gasped. She was with you in the battle, wasn't she? Link hesitated, looking down and studying the grain of wood for a time. Yes, for a while she was. She can speak to me at times. She's the one who told me that they were going for the hill. There was a silence at the table for a time. Pura and Impa looked at each other, their expressions difficult to read. Finally, Impa looked back to Link. Some villagers saw her with you. What? It is something that I heard following the battle. Some in the crowd claimed to have seen a woman floating in the air just above you while you fought. I did not think much of it at the time. A hallucination, perhaps. But now I wonder if they were seeing her. And even I thought I heard her voice at one point. Link didn't reply for a long time. Had she been there, that close throughout the fight? Had she been subtly helping him during it? He hadn't felt her, but his mind had been focused on the task at hand. So... Burra said, drawing out the vowel. You're able to talk to her right now, and she can see you. At least some of the time, she comes and goes. But she can actually see you. Yes. So, we can say with confidence that Zelda has seen you nude. Pura looked over at Robbie. That means I win. Robbie looks confused, head turning to glance at Link and Pura. What? What are you talking about? Our bet. Bet? Oh, come on, Robbie. You don't remember our bet? I bet you that Zelda totally got the chance to see Link in the buff. You what? Link said, alarmed. Robbie frowned at her, and then his eyes widened. Ah! Pura! I hardly think that this counts. Nope, it counts. You owe me 50 rupees. No, no. I think that Princess Zelda's current state as a disembodied semi-deific being 
is beyond the scope of that bet. And that was over 100 years ago. I believe that bet stipulated that it would happen during their travels. Wait, why would you bet that? Link demanded. Why would Zelda have... Oh, stop being so flustered, Linky. You two were traveling around a lot together, and we just had a friendly wager going on. I bet, Robbie, that Zelda would come across you naked at least once. Bonus if it was intentional, which... If she's been watching you, then I would call that intentional. Robbie, you old fart, you owe me 75 rupees! Impa groaned softly, reaching up and rubbing her forehead. Honestly, Pa, we have much more important things to be... What other bets did you have going on? Link asked, cutting off Impa. Pura hummed for a second, bobbing her head from side to side as she thought. Well, there was also the bet that you would sneak a glimpse at Zelda when she was bathing. What? I wouldn't... And then I bet Rao once that you two probably snuggled up to keep warm together. He hated that. You can't be serious. She began ticking off on her fingers as she continued. I also bet one of the maids that she would run off on you at least twice. You won that one. And I tried to get Impa to bet that you two would end up sharing a bedroll. If you know what I mean. But she yelled at me pretty good for it. Prude. Link felt his face turn a deep shade of red, and he stammered, struggling to articulate a proper response for this. Impa cleared her throat, pursing her lips at Pura. Are you finished, dear sister? Pura thought about it for a moment and then shrugged. She turned back to Robbie. Cough up the gems, old man. Robbie scowled at her and then reached down into his bag. Impa looked at Link, her expression serious. Now, I do have an important question for you, Link. Link licked his lips, trying not to think on Pura's bets. What is it? She gave Pura a sidelong look, and then her lips twitched into a mischievous smile. If I'd agreed to that bet in the first place, who would have... Pura screamed with laughter, and Impa cackled. Link groaned, lowering his face into his hands. Can we drop this, please? Impa chortled and waved her hand. Of course, of course, I'm just... She exhaled slowly. I am excited to see the end of all of this. To see the princess again. It makes me feel younger. You know... I can make that a reality, Pura said, eyes twinkling. Just a little trip up to my lab and you'll have all the guys looking at you again. No. Pura shrugged. If you say so, little sister. Personally, I think it's great. You realize that I can basically live forever, right? I can literally sell immortality. I'm going to be rich. Link cleared his throat loudly, silencing the discussion before it could go any further. He sat up straighter and hoped that his flush had faded. I've got one last thing that I want to do before the attack. Oh? Robbie asked. What is that? I want to take a trip to Mount Laneru, to the Spring of Wisdom. Pura quirked an eyebrow and then leaned forward, tapping the table with a long nail. Why? Did you know? Link felt his neck growing warm again, and he closed his eyes, taking a deep breath. But it's a gap in the memories that I want to fill. Ganon rose right after that, right? I'd like to see what happened those last few days before everything went wrong. I think it will help. How much do you remember now, Link? Impa asked. I know a lot now. And more comes back every day. But that... I think going there will help. Impa nodded slowly. It seems reasonable. There isn't much else you can do now at least until the Divine Beasts arrive. But are you certain you wish to relive that again? I imagine that some of those memories, especially the ones that follow, are... unpleasant. He smiled somberly, eyes growing distant. Yesterday, I remember dying. I hardly think it can get any more unpleasant than that. Silence fell among the four at the table. Finally, Pura clapped her hands together. Well... Now that you've completely ruined this mood, it's settled. Me and Robbie will keep working on the Guardians, Link will go on a quest to recover some memories, and Impa... She looked at her sister curiously. Impa sighed softly. I will return to Kakarika Village. 
I still have some people to lead. And a new era to prepare for, Link. I recommend that is where you begin your journey as well. There is a path from Kakariko that leads to the mountain. Snap. Sounds like we've got a plan. Making his way through the village after their conference was even more uncomfortable than the day prior. Yesterday, the people had praised Link as a hero. After the previous night's battle, he felt he had taken on an even more legendary status in their eyes. Even Nat, who rarely seemed to let his deeds affect how she treated him, just watched him as he walked past. There was a time I longed for quiet, he thought. A wry quirk to his lips. Even before the calamity, I didn't want to be the hero. But I suspected someone would tell me that was a heroic quality in itself. The village had suffered even more damage in the battle the night prior than he'd realized. Several of the homes and shop had burned down after the initial fire, the structures no more than blackened skeletons now. It would take a long time for things to be rebuilt, and Link doubted it would ever be back to the way it was. The bodies, at least, had been cleared away, though the gruesome work left many of the townspeople and warriors that he saw looking haggard. They'd likely been up much of the night while he rested. He glanced up towards the hill behind the village. From this distance it looked pristine, but he could still remember seeing it the night before. A line of Lizalthos sprinting up it to reach Pura's lab. What a nightmare that had been. Link! He looked around and spotted Sedan emerging from the triage. Much of the color had returned to his scales, and he walked tall with the light-scaled trident held casually in one hand. Link smiled broadly and hurried over to him. Sedan, I'm glad to see you made it through all right. He grasped his friend's hand, tightly. Oh, most of us came out of that just fine. Those things were difficult to kill, but not very skilled in combat. Most of them didn't even have weapons. What about the triage? We protected them, of course. And did you think we wouldn't? He laughed softly and shook his head. No. I know you wouldn't have let anything happen to them. I just... Last night is a blur. I'd imagine it was, especially for you. The stories that I've been hearing. Don't worry about those. What about your guards? Did they all make it out? Save for a few new scars... They're all right. Baz is already going on about how the cuts in his fin will make him more attractive. And Rivan is determined to relearn how to fight with a sword so that he can still serve in my guard with his missing arm. Gaddison somehow found time to make a necklace out of bokoblin horns. Good. Do you know where the others are? The other... He hesitated. What did he call his group of friends? Sidon, Yanobo, Teba, and Riju. All helped him defeat the Divine Beasts. They were all, as far as he was concerned, worthy. The other champions. Oh, is that what we are calling ourselves now? Well, two of you are already learning how to control the Divine Beasts, and I'm sure the other two will be doing so as well. Hmm. An interesting point. Well, come. I just saw young Yanobo in the triage. I believe Teba already left to go back and rally the remainder of his warriors and inform Ravali of the coming battle. Little Riju is still around here somewhere. I spoke to her earlier, and she indicated that she would be traveling with her Gruda warriors. Link followed Sedan into the tent. A hush fell over the wounded as he entered, and he kept his face carefully neutral. Would these people ever be able to treat him like an ordinary man again? He spotted Dinobo a moment later, sitting on the ground while a short Zora woman inspected his arm. The Goron saw him a moment later and raised the same arm in greeting, only to wince and lower it quickly, grimacing. Link made his way over. What happened to you? Yenobo smiled broadly up at Link. I got attacked by one of those moblins. Oh, is that a good thing? Yes, because I didn't run away from it. I knew we had to keep blocking off that gate, so I just... He used his other arm to make a fist and then a punching motion. I mean, it got right back up and then someone cut off its head. But I still fought back. Link laughed. Doric would be proud. How was your arm? 
Inoba glanced towards where the Zora was inspecting what appeared to be a deep cut along his bicep. He blanched and quickly looked away. It's okay. It's not that bad, really. Well, don't overdo it. He remained by Yanobo's side for several minutes before finally bidding the Goron farewell and moving on to another of the tent's occupants. Dorian lay on the ground, being tended to by an older Sheikah woman, but his eyes widened when he saw Link. With a soft groan, he pushed himself up to his seated position. Master Link, he said, as Link knelt beside him. It's good to see you walking about. The same to you, Link said. When I saw you last, Pia was worrying. Well, I'm glad to see you came out of the fight all right. Dorian nodded, but then winced, reaching up to prod his forehead gently. As well as can be expected, I suppose. He hesitated and then glanced back at the Sheikah woman. Please, I'm feeling fine. Why don't you go check on someone else? The woman pursed her wrinkled lips, but then turned, walking away to another Sheikah, whose torso was wrapped with bandages. Dorian watched her for a moment before looking back at Link. I apologize, Master Link. But I must ask you, before the battle began, you told Lady Impa something. You said that the Yika clan had been defeated, is that true? Link met his eyes, searching. The things that he'd seen in the hideout. Had Dorian once truly believed those things? Had he known all along about the Yiga's experiments with Guardian technology? Had he worshipped Ganon? It all seemed so unlike this reliable, kindly man. They are, as far as I know. I'm sure some still survive. I'll probably have to keep an eye out for retaliation, now that I think about it. But Koga is dead. And the Gerudo killed a lot of them. Hopefully enough to break the organization. Dorian closed his eyes tightly, and his expression showed some of the emotion that he was repressing. Finally, when he spoke again, his voice came out thick and halted. Thank you. You... I know that this likely means little in the face of everything. But your actions have likely ensured that my daughters will be safe. I had feared that I would have to take them and run when the rest of the Yika got wind of my betrayal. Link smiled faintly and reached out, squeezing Dorian's shoulder. I'm glad I could help. The older man's eyes shot open, and he reached up, placing a hand over Link's. Master Link, if there is anything you ever need, anything at all, please do not hesitate to ask. I will forever be in your debt for what you have done. Link swallowed and nodded, not sure what to say. Finally, he bid Dorian farewell, standing up and finding Sedan speaking with one of the Zora healers, who looked quite flustered to have the prince speaking to her. When he saw Link, however, he smiled and disengaged before tilting his head towards another of the tent's occupants. Ah, Link! Prince Sedan! It is wonderful to see you both again, Kaz said, bowing slightly towards the prince as they approached. Sedan clapped a hand on Cass's shoulder. Cass, how's my song coming along? I'm still writing it, unfortunately. As you can imagine, there has been quite a few events as of late that I have begun writing songs for. The Rito glanced at Link, beaming. Sedan laughed. <laughs> Splendid! I look forward to hearing all about Link's misadventures once this is through. And I assure you that I will make my first stop Zora's Domain. It would only be right, as that was where this all began, and where we all had our own first adventure. I remember it like it was yesterday, Sedan said. I don't, Link said. It feels like years ago to me by now. Kaos chuckled. You have certainly done enough in the last three months to earn such a statement. Speaking of that, when you have a chance I would love to hear about your experiences in the Gerudo Desert. Link grimaced slightly. There are parts that I would really like to leave out of a song. You mean the part where you had to dress up as a woman? Sidon asked. Lead you told you? Cass's eyes widened. Oh, now I do need to hear this story. Please, Link. I promise you I will not put this into any of the epic song about you. He paused. Now the comedies, however. 
Link groaned. No, no, I don't want anyone to be singing about what a cute Hylian Vi I made. Sidon laughed. Though, you should hear some of the Gerudo talk about you already. Many of them seem to be very taken with you. I'm going to have a very stern conversation with Riju about this. Both Cass and Sidon chuckled, and he soon relaxed. They spoke for several minutes, during which time he did relay some of the experiences in the desert, including the first experiences with Gerudo hospitality, and their prison. Finally, however, he sighed. I actually came by to tell you that I'm leaving for a time. Oh? Cass asked. There's one last thing that I have to do before the end. One more missing piece that I need to collect. Regarding your memories. Link nodded. Cass smiled in that knowing way of his, and Link frowned slightly. And you know something, don't you? About? Link gave him a flat look, and Cass laughed. Ah, you mean you and the princess? I wondered when you might finally ask me. I... Tell me, my friend. What are your feelings on the matter? Have you come to a conclusion yourself? Link hesitated. He wondered if Zelda was watching him now, if she could hear him. In that moment, he decided that he didn't want to admit his feelings for her to Cass. Not like this. Besides, the Rito had clearly known about them long before he even had. I have, was all he said. Cass smiled warmly. And would it not be better for you to hear of those things from the princess herself? Link felt heat rise up the back of his neck, and he cleared his throat. Right, you are, as usual. He paused, and then his eyes widened, a thought occurring to him. Oh! I know a bit about your teacher, Cass. Really? What did you remember about him? That I didn't like him. Link chuckled. The man was far too good with his words. Cass smiled merrily and reached out, placing a wing on Link's shoulder. Yet it was he... That was most jealous of you. Link smirked, eyes twinkling with mischief. Maybe rightfully so. Finally, he left Cass behind to continue his music for the injured. Sedan walked back out into the sunlight with him. I have no idea what any of that was about, Azora said, looking down at Link. Link laughed. And I'm going to keep it that way. Sorry. No, no. It is quite all right. Sedan's smile grew wistful. I will be going back to Zora's domain soon, to join Mifa upon Ruta, for its march on central Hyrule. I am glad to have had the chance to see you before I left. Me too, Sedan. Thank you for everything. We wouldn't have survived without you and your warriors. Sedan grinned. Of course, my friend. And it goes without saying, any time you should need aid. We will provide it again. Same here. I suppose I shall see you in what? Two weeks? Link nodded, his smile fading. Two weeks. Sidon held out his hand and Link grasped it firmly. When we meet again, Link. He found Riju standing near a series of pyres just outside of Hatano village. Boliara at her side along with Captain Tika and Liana, and many other Gerudo warriors. Each fallen Gerudo had been placed on her own wooden pyre. There were at least twenty of the pyres lined up in rows, and the smoke from each rose into the sky in thick black columns, before mingling together and blowing away with a breeze. An older Gerudo spoke just loudly enough that the gathered Gerudo could hear, but Link couldn't understand her. The funeral rites were in their native Gerudo tongue. He watched solemn, as the other Gerudo repeated certain phrases together, and then a group of them, each dressed in ceremonial golden armor, slammed the butts of their spears to the ground rhythmatically. Each thud felt like a blow to Link. He had protected many, but not all. He would never be able to protect everyone, no matter how hard he tried. It took several minutes before the funeral rites were completed. By the end, each of the pyres were fully ablaze, the orange flames rising high into the sky. Riju did not move or shift during it, 
standing straight and regal, in far more formal attire than he'd ever seen her in. Gone were the sand seal patterned skirts replaced by a dark, nearly black skirt, adorned with the symbol of the Gerudo. She wore golden armor on her shoulders, like her Gerudo warriors, and the crown glimmered prominently upon her head. As the last words were spoken by the Gerudo elder, the gathered women all raised their heads, ululating. And then the gathering broke. Some women turned while others remained close, holding pouches that he assumed would be used to gather the ashes. Lincoln didn't approach the gathering, fearing what it would do to him to be that close to those whom he'd failed. He knew logically that such thoughts were wrong. These were warriors who fought for a just cause. They fought to save lives just as he had. Yet the fact that they had to fight at all still bothered him. Eventually, Riju turned. Her expression was stoic and far older looking than he was used to seeing. She saw him, meeting his eyes, and nodded. She glanced up towards Buliara, speaking softly, and the tall guard glanced over as well. She looked at Link appraisingly, before turning her face back down to Riju and nodding. Riju left the gathering and Buliara and made her way over to where Link stood. I'm happy to see you awake, she said, giving him a solemn smile. Link forced his gaze away from the burning pyres and met Riju's eyes. Yeah, I... The words died on his tongue. Why was this so difficult for him to face? I wanted to come and thank you, for... His eyes darted back up to the crackling fires. Everything. It was only natural that we would help. After all, you saved our people. She paused. Link? His eyes found hers again. She frowned up at him. Sorry, I... How did he explain? How could he? Is the sight of the dead so difficult for you Hylians? The words so blunt were like a slap to his face. What? No. No, it's not the death. It's just... He exhaled slowly, looking away. I'm responsible for them. There was a silence for a time, long enough that Link began to grow concerned. He finally looked back down at her, and was surprised to see that her expression had grown angry. Her hands clenched into fists, and she looked ready to use them. I am the Gerudo chieftain. She met his eyes brazenly. And my people are my responsibility. I'm not saying that you do not assume that you are responsible just because you needed our help. Her words were sharp, at complete odds with her small, childish frame. You did not order my warriors into battle. I did. Do you understand? He remained silent, not fully trusting his own words right now. Riju glared at him, but then released a pent-up breath, relaxing her hands. We achieved a great victory yesterday. Captain Tika warned me that it would be a difficult, likely impossible fight. I knew that many would die. I was prepared to lose far more. I'm surprised that you weren't. It's not that I knew that some would die. He glanced back towards the pyres and spoke in a softer tone. I just can't bear the thought. Well, that is stupid. He looked back at her, eyebrows raising. It's stupid? That I don't want people to die for me? Yes. Why is that stupid? Because we are at war, are we not? People will die. And what makes you think they died for you? That's stupid too. They died to protect these people. And, as your villagers are still alive, they did not die in vain. Her words brought back memories of his battle on the Blatchery Plains. He'd fought to protect the towns beyond Fort Hatano, and he'd fought to protect Zelda. Ultimately, though, he'd fallen. He had accomplished both, had he not? At least, he had bought enough time for Zelda. The image in his mind of her stepping out in front of him, protecting him, blossomed again into his mind, and it was nearly enough to take his breath away. Why then? Why had her power awoken at that moment? Link. He came back to the present and focused again on Riju. 
He felt... different suddenly. The deaths of the Gerudo bothered him still, as did any fallen Zora, Gorons, Rito, Hylians, and Sheikah. Yet, her words rang true. None of it had been in vain. Still, he had to know something. How... How do you make that decision, Riju? To send my warriors to their deaths. He nodded and she frowned, looking down. In that moment, she seemed to shrink away slightly. We Gerudo will always do what needs to be done. That is not always easy, but necessary. And to try to spare my warriors from all harm would be a... She struggled to find the right word. Bad service. It would be a bad service to their dedication and skill. So you accept their deaths because they are warriors. Riju remained silent for a time, and Link thought that he saw some of her own conflict on her expression. This was a burden to her, and a difficult one for someone so young to bear. Yet bear it she did. He didn't think he would ever look at her as merely a child again. To achieve victory, sacrifices must be made. This calamity cannon. If it breaks free again, it will not merely stomp at your Hylian lands. It will eventually come for the Gerudo, too. Stopping that from happening is worth any sacrifice. And saving the village? A look of annoyance passed over her face. I already told you. You saved us, too. If you hadn't come to the desert, we would have never stopped Naboris. Far more than that, she pointed at the funeral pyres, would have died. Do you think that the Gerudo would not seek to repay our debt? Link remained silent, frowning. Those words still made him feel somewhat responsible, though he understood her meaning. Besides, Riju looked away from him, face softening. You are not the only one who wishes to protect innocence. Thanks, Riju. I doubt we would have made it without your help. She smirked slightly and nodded. True. Our debt has been repaid then. She paused and looked up at him. But that does not mean that we will not provide aid in the coming battle, and in your rebuilding efforts. He smiled, standing just a little taller. Rebuilding. A life after Ganon. It was not such a distant hope any longer. He remained with Riju for a short time after, before finally bidding her farewell. She turned back to her people, that remained, and he began walking away. Link! He stomped as Bulyara walked up to him. Her armor pieces were polished to a golden sheen, and she had gotten a new claymore at some point, which she wore rather than carried in her hand. When she reached him, she looked down at him, her expression serious. But then finally... She reached up to her forearm and removed one of her golden van braces. She held it out to Link, which he took with a frown, turning it over in his hands. I don't understand, he finally said. Boliara's nostrils flared with irritation. Lady Riju told me of what you did upon the hill. You protected her in my absence. And you did so other times as well. I have not forgotten. I... Thanks, Bolyara, but I still don't... She snorted. The armor I wear signifies that I am the chief's personal guard, and attendant. She may have other guards, but only I have the honor of wearing it. She paused. Now, do you understand? Yes. Link held the piece of armor a little more reverently. Thanks, Bolyara. It's an honor. She nodded curtly, and then held out her hand. He reached out, grasping her forearm, meeting her eyes. I will see you upon the battlefield, she said before releasing him. Yeah. I'll see you there. <laughs>